Imagine an alternate history where the US is adamant at staying neutral in World War II. Not only does it not send its armed forces anywhere, but it doesn't want to have anything to do with any warring side. No economic help and no big government trade with any belligerent. Come September 1939, the US goes into full self-isolation mode and simply doesn't want to be a part of it. How would such a move shape the course of World War II? The US staying neutral in the war would create a hugely different alternate history timeline, and those are always fun to speculate on. But they're even more fun being played out by yourself, like in Call of War, a game sponsoring this video. Call of War is a free online PvP strategy. You choose a real country and lead it during World War II, making decisions about economy, diplomacy, troop compositions and attack routes. The outcome of the war slowly unravels in real time, before your eyes, or the course of days or even weeks. I love that slow play aspect, as you have to plan ahead, sometimes for days. And there's a special offer for new players. Click on the link in the description and you will get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. Try it out! Onward with our version of the history. In reality, isolationism was quite popular in the US between the two world wars. When the war started in 1939, the US did not influence it in a meaningful way. The real impact of US aid started to be felt only in 1940 and later, as war production ramped up. In our alternate timeline, the US political climate is such that the US is firmly set on helping no one and just staying out of it. The US government bans any trade of strategic materials, weapons and such, even if it is to its own economic detriment. Trade partner nations are required to use their own ships and crews to haul goods to Europe. So the US armed forces stay pretty much the same size as they were in 1939, instead of growing 37 times over. During our alternate 1940, however, the first ripple effects of US self-isolation are felt in Europe. All European nations suffer some goods shortages due to lower trade. But the Germany was already blockaded from the start of the war by Britain, so the US not trading with Germany would have a minuscule impact compared to the US not trading with the British Commonwealth. Indeed, even second-hand trade would be impacted, like between the UK and Canada, India or Australia, and that's not taking into account the endangered shipping routes those trade ripples would continuously eat into the Allied economic effort. In the real timeline, the US promptly started selling and giving military equipment and goods. In September 1940, the US sent the first big aid package. It gave the Royal Navy 50 of its old destroyers. By December, Britain was unable to pay for supplies. So land lease started, where the US was basically giving away supplies to its allies. In the alternate timeline, Britain would likely run out of money even a bit earlier, and there would be no land lease. Still, as France fell, Britain was in decent shape back in 1940. Its navy was much stronger than the German one, forcing Germany to resort to asymmetric naval warfare by using submarines. Indeed, Britain had three times as many capital ships as Germany, over three times as many cruisers and almost nine times as many destroyers. German submarine numbers were similar to those of the British in 1940, but started to rise in the second half of 1941 and especially during 1942. Of course, the British fleet had many seas to protect, so it had to disperse its fleet. Protecting the northern route, responsible for sending aid to Russia, was important, as was the whole route from the British Isles to Egypt, and the Italian navy was still a threat. Of course, it's very likely the same devastating attack by the British would still happen in late 1940, taking out some of the Italian ships and scaring them away from big offensive ops for some time to come. And nevertheless, at least two British battleships, six cruisers, a carrier, over a dozen destroyers and most of the British submarines were usually on patrol in the Mediterranean during the war the Battle of Britain would likely go the very same way it did in the real timeline. The German Air Force would get their nose bloody, and come fall of 1940, the British would still be outproducing Germany when it comes to aircraft. Even with added pressure on the British economy, 
Due to the lack of trade, aid and the German submarine campaign, it's not likely Germany would match the British production numbers before 1942, a year earlier than in the real timeline. Still, after the Battle of Britain and Dunkirk, the British would not really be an offensive force throughout 1941. Of course, one of the two big events of the real timeline of 1941 would still happen. Germany would attack the Soviet Union in June and enjoy the same initial success as the Soviets were unprepared and greatly dispersed. German losses were several times smaller than Soviet ones, but still substantial, especially in experienced manpower, which is hard to replace. Hardware losses such as tanks and aircraft were even more lopsided. Yet, even after the Soviets lost territories accounting for roughly one-third of their population by December 1941, they did not give up. By then, the British were already sending some aid to the Soviets. In December, British landed tanks constituted one-third of the heavy and medium tanks defending Moscow. Anyway, just like in the real timeline, the Soviets would stop the German advance by the very end of 1941. That was mostly due to the weather, overextension of German supply lines and the additional Soviet divisions, some mobilized and some transferred from other regions. Indeed, the Soviet Union conscripted 5 million extra men during the first 8 days of the war, doubling the size of its military personnel, but months were needed to train those recruits and get them to the front lines. One event that would not happen in this alternate timeline is the Japanese attack on the US. There were even real timeline events that would now be observed in a different light. In 1939, the US scrapped its trade treaty with Japan. In 1940, trade of sensitive goods with Japan, such as metals, was banned. A real summer of 1941 saw all trade stop, including all fuels. In this alternate timeline, the US would do that to all belligerents. Japan would not really feel it was pressured by the US any more than Britain or the Soviets were. And the US seizure of Japanese assets in 1941 would not happen in this timeline either. So instead of drawing plans to attack the US, which commenced in early 1941, now a different target set would likely be made. Japan would still attack the British Navy, as in the December of 1941 of the real timeline. The Soviet Union would likely not get attacked, as that would still call for a much bigger land force than Japan could free up back then. But the neutrality pact with the Soviet Union, which was signed in April of 1941, might very well never happen as the Japanese would try to keep their options open. That might lead to the Soviets keeping a somewhat bigger force near Japan throughout the war. Indeed, come early 1942, the might of the Japanese Navy would wreak havoc on the British assets in the Pacific. Without the US Navy's involvement, it's likely non-US islands in the Pacific would quickly fall. While Australia would likely be too big of a bite, it's not out of the question that the British Dominion of New Zealand would eventually fall. But even more worryingly for the British, the vast Japanese fleet would cut off not only the resources from Australia, but it would also freely operate in the Indian Ocean, cutting the British from the resources coming from India and partially Persia as well. With most of the British fleet protecting the Mediterranean, Atlantic and Norwegian sea routes, the British would not be able to dispatch a large enough force so far from its main bases to engage the Japanese in the Indian Ocean, especially since their forces already lost some big ships in the initial Japanese attacks. Where exactly would the British Navy make a stand is hard to say, but the fall of its base on Ceylon would be likely sometime in 1942. The Persian Gulf would also likely be cut off leaving the British with guarding the approach to the Red Sea and Suez. The British might also find themselves outproduced by the Japanese. It's likely that the Japanese advantage in aircraft carriers would allow them to dictate the course of any battle in the Indian Ocean. And the Japanese losses that did happen in the real timeline would be much lower in the alternate timeline, as almost all of Japan's ships were sunk by the US. That same effect on Axis navies would be also felt in the Atlantic and the Med as well. Thus the Royal Navy would be under immense pressure, especially from 1942 onward. 
even the Italian Navy losses would be smaller in this alternate timeline. And that's assuming the British could muster enough ships in the Med with all these new ripple effects going on. The effect of the German U-boats now free to concentrate their forces just in a few areas, while at the same time free from the US Navy, would severely impact the British economy. In the real timeline, Germany built over 1100 U-boats and lost almost 800. But almost two-thirds were destroyed by the US. No US also means no aid to the British. No 33 escort carriers built by the US and landed to the Royal Navy. And no other land lease help throughout the war. The US land lease contributed 10% of all British food supply during the war. And even so, the British were quite low on food. With even less stuff coming in due to more plentiful German subs, there might actually be sporadic famine in the winter months in Britain. And it was Britain who was by far the biggest land lease beneficiary during the war. The US sent 50 billion worth of goods, services and armaments via land lease. That represented 17% of its total war expenditure. When it comes to aircraft alone, the US sent a year and a half worth of British aircraft production to the UK. In the real timeline, Britain was also sending stuff to the Soviet Union. 5,000 tanks and 3,000 hurricane fighters, among a bunch of other stuff. But with no help from the US, alternate timeline figures might be different. The British might even double down on aid to Russia. Of course, it was the US land lease aid that made a big contribution to the Soviet war effort as well. Little over half of the overall US aid to other countries was weapons, a third were various goods, materials and food, and the rest was various services, like construction of the industrial ecosystem in the US. And a good chunk of that aid was hundreds of thousands of trucks and thousands of railway platform systems that helped the Soviet logistics effort. But how much did all the aid influence the overall Soviet war effort? By the end of 1941, as the Soviets stopped Germany at Moscow, the effect was minuscule. But then during 1942, aid volume kept increasing. The 1943 volume was double that of the previous year. Certain vital ingredients the Soviets did not produce whatsoever, like natural rubber. But even specialized metals, chemicals or high-performance high-octane fuel was not produced in great quantities. Some of those would likely be sourced from elsewhere, but in what quantities? And would those shipments make it safely to the USSR? The Soviets would definitely feel the pinch, production-wise. But the Allied aid, when observed overall, still constituted a fairly small part of the overall Russian war effort. The Soviet budget outlays show it quite clearly. In 1942, for example, the overall worth of imported munitions and equipment amounted to 6% of overall munitions and equipment procured or produced domestically. By 1944, that grew to 10% for armaments and almost 20% for food. The war effort in the Soviet Union was such that the civilian and agriculture workforce dropped by an astounding 50% during the war. Evidently, in the alternate timeline, there would have to be even more workers in the field, leaving fewer in factories and on the battlefield. And yet, with all those changes, it's not likely the Soviet Union would exactly have its tank production or aircraft production halved in the alternate timeline. So the Soviets would still outproduce Germany. Without the US aid and allied invasion of France, the USSR numerical superiority in armor in any given year would probably halve. Then again, the Soviets would, due to those smaller numbers, likely suffer greater losses, especially if they tried attacking, which might result in a more static frontline. So instead of the Allies making over half a million aircraft facing 200,000 Axis ones, it's likely the Axis would be able to make a bit more, facing under 250,000 Allied planes. Almost parity in aircraft. So what else would happen? Italy would likely not surrender, as it would never get invaded. It would keep helping Germany, though its contribution to the war effort would remain small. In November 1942, before the US involvement got to be significant, the British managed to stop Germany in its tracks in North Africa, and deliver a series of counterattacks. 
Germany would likely be on the retreat in this alternate timeline as well. But now the US would not be there for the Allied invasion of Morocco and Algeria, so the Axis would have an easier task defending. It's quite likely that with the weaker British naval presence, the Axis would always keep some presence in North Africa. Japan would most likely do quite well in this alternate history. It would be able to haul resources from various territories it would capture. It would not be losing ships and planes by the dozens and hundreds. It would have no big enemy, with Britain mostly on the defensive. In theory, if Japan presses on the British with some landings near the Middle East, perhaps even a renewed German push towards Egypt might be workable. But it's worth remembering that Japan and Germany weren't really that close and coordinated in the real timeline. Besides that non-aggression pact with the Soviets, Japan also led through US aid to Russia, coming via Pacific. Japan inspected but let pass all the ships under the Soviet flag, carrying food, materials, vehicles and so on. They were avoiding any excuse for a war with the Soviets. Japan was also preoccupied with their conquest of China. It's likely they would have still poured most of their land resources there, with the remainder set for taking nearby territories in Asia and the Pacific. Aside from naval incursions, it's not likely Japan would desire undertaking a big land campaign far from their home. Back on the Eastern Front, the alternate timeline would still likely see that initial Soviet success around Moscow in late 1941, but it's also likely the now weaker Soviets would have more trouble holding back Germany in the summer of 1942, when Germany undertook an offensive toward the Caucasus. It's not impossible that Germany would even manage to reach the Caucasus in this alternate timeline, but it would still likely not enjoy instant access to fuel, first due to Soviet sabotages and then due to British air power from Persia joining the Soviet air power, keeping those oil fields under attack. One thing the Soviets were seemingly not short of was manpower. In the real timeline, they slowly but surely outnumbered Germany. By 1945, German numbers finally collapsed. But in fact, the Soviets were nearly as exhausted manpower-wise as the Germans. Germany mobilized 22% of their population during the war. The Soviets mobilized between 17 and 26% of the population. Britain, being isolated on an island, could do two things in this alternate timeline. Keep producing ships and planes and just harass Germany without any real possibility of having an overwhelmingly bigger force than Germany, which would be required for a successful landing of its own and an opening of a big new front. Or Britain could use the fact it still controls the Norwegian Sea and send troops, not just equipment, to the Soviet Union. Sure, Churchill did not trust Stalin, but this would be a do-or-die situation. So it's not unimaginable there would be British fighting alongside the Soviets on the Eastern Front by 1943 or so. Overall, during the entire war, the British Empire mobilized some 8.5 million people. But of the 2.8 million mobilized in other British dominions, only some would be able to fight in Europe. So the end result might be a sizable force in Russia, accumulated over the years, helping pressure Germany. End of war figures for the British might even be double the one shown. Sometime in 1943 the frontline movements would come to a crawl. The Axis would have more resources than in the real timeline. The Allied bombing efforts against German industry would be just a shadow of what they really were. Still, Germany could not hope to advance along the huge front line in the east. The Allies would still manage to outproduce and outnumber Germany by some margin. So by 1944, after a series of costly battles to the Allies, it's possible the Axis would regroup and retreat from some of the territory on the eastern front, making their defense lines and supply lines shorter. With more troops per mile of the front, the German line would become more defensible. Attacking usually takes a lot more firepower and more manpower than the defender has. That's something the Soviets, even with some British help, might not always count on. Being even more exhausted, both in production and manpower, than in the real timeline. In reality, most successful Soviet pushes towards Berlin usually required at least two times more troops. Unless, like in the early offensives, 
the Soviets were losing several times more troops than the Germans. As the Soviets and the British would push towards Germany and lose a few times as many troops in the process, the Soviet and British war machines would come near their breaking point. Soviet manpower losses were huge even in the real timeline, and trying to push towards Berlin with fewer resources and against a stronger Germany would be disastrous. Operation Bagration is just one example where US landed logistics equipment played a big role. In our timeline, such huge sweeping offensives would not be quick. If the Soviets overextended, then even Japan might smell blood and pounce on Soviet Far East territories. Though the Soviets might also simply not reinforce those territories and concentrate on Germany first. The British would suffer more, both in manpower and in their economy, as German air power would be able to operate from France in numbers, thwarting British attempts to monitor the seas, which means German submarines would be more free to keep squeezing supply routes. Both the Allies and the Axis, except for Japan, would be absolutely exhausted come 1945 or 1946. Front movements would become insignificant without the huge snowball effect that the US had on the war. It's quite possible that eventually there would be a ceasefire that all sides would have an interest in. And within months there might be a peace treaty with which all sides would be unhappy with. But still, one that all sides would accept as their populations might revolt and simply be unwilling to fight further. It would be a whole new world after such a war with Britain losing a million more troops than it did, and its economy in tatters. The Soviet Union would be a shadow of what it was, suffering millions more casualties than it did in reality. Germany would fare better than it did, but it would still be faced with holding large territories of hostile conquered population ready to uprise. The US would actually fare worse staying neutral. The lack of trade would make an impact but the lack of war efforts supercharging its industry and technology base would be even worse. It might not rule the 20th century like it did in reality. And the future conflict with Japan, now a sprawling Asian superpower, would be all but inevitable. Now a few more words on Call of War. The map of the world is huge, look at all these provinces to conquer and control. You can participate in epic battles and finally try to take over the world. But watch out, there will be up to 100 other real players, controlling other countries, trying to do the same. Knowing who to declare war on and who to ally with can be crucial. Then, of course, it's up to you whether you will stab your former ally in the back, conquering the entire planet. There are over 120 different historically accurate units. There's resource trading and different terrain types affect movement and combat. There's a lot of stuff to take into account when choosing your strategy. The game can be played on PC and mobile platforms with the same account. So give it a try. Click that link below and get an exclusive gift. 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. That offer is available for 30 days only. Choose your country and change the course of World War II. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.